Michael Bohm, uh, youth apologetics training, and uh, he's been doing his podcast covering a slew of different mm -hmm. topics related to apologetics for a number of years. And uh, now he has taken on a role as a teaching pastor, I guess you could call it, of Calvary Chapel in Berthid, Colorado. And so I'm glad to have him on my channel and we have Jason Oaks, Pastor Jason Oaks of Emmanuel Baptist Church in Roundup, Montana, also of people of the free gift. Like what about uh, the Seventh-day Adventists? Many people believe uh, that they are Christians. Um, certainly, uh, now that I have left the company I was with uh, previously, something I've never announced on any audio is I, I had the opportunity to put in a security system into uh, the voice, uh, what is it called now? Voice of Prophecy, okay, okay which is a huge organization for, uh, for the, the uh, Seventh-day Adventists, uh, Sean Boonstra. Okay, got to meet him face-to-face, -face, shake his hand. Uh, talk to him a little bit. I'm sure he won't recognize or remember me, but that doesn't matter. Um, they are very nice people. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, in some respects, they're wonderful people. Yeah. Um, as some of them, I've, I've had several friends in the past. It's very obvious they are trusting in Christ alone uh, for their salvation. Mm -hmm. okay? Others, though, and if you follow the official doctrines as spelled out by Ellen White, not so much. Uh, we're seeing more of a faith plus works. And so anyway, they have a, a, a translation of the Bible called the Clear Wood, if I can say it, easy for me to say, right? The Clear Word Translation or Clear Word Bible. Yeah. What have you found about that translation? Okay, uh, for one thing, and uh, unless you know a little bit about Seventh-day Adventist doctrine, you wouldn't necessarily understand uh, the terminology if you saw it. But in Daniel 8.14, um, she writes in the investigative judgment doctrine into Daniel 8.14. So it, the investigative judgment doctrine, uh, for those who aren't aware, uh, when... The Great Disappointment in 1844 happened. There was two groups that had students of um, William Miller at the time, and they refused to give up on the fact that Jesus didn't come back at, on that day. And so one was the Jehovah's Witnesses and Charles States Russell. The other was Ellen White. And so they uh, came up with their individual interpretations of what happened. And Ellen White's explanation was that Jesus moved from one end of heaven to another, which is basically the file cabinet room in heaven, where he's going through all of the files, and he, uh, he is uh, figuring out who is worthy to get into heaven. Now, when she was teaching it, she was also teaching a shut door doctrine, which basically no one was able to get in and alter the records past that point. But if you follow that, Jesus has been busy apparently in heaven since 1844 going through these files because I guess it takes him a while. I don't know. but He's apparently not om omnipotent <laughs> according to their theology. That really... Well, yeah. Yeah. And they, they've uh, more recently, uh, they technically... He's the Trinity, but they have to get around some uh, funky wording because it's not necessarily the same. Like they would say we believe in the Trinity, but it's not quite the same. I'm still trying to sort that one out um, with them, but that's an example. Now, their dietary stuff also shows up in the clear word. Um, so Genesis 9-3 Many of these animals will provide food for you. And from now on, you may eat meat as well as vegetables. So in the, like ESV, for example, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. They change that to many of these animals will provide food for you. And so, again, little subtle things to mm -hmm. where they can then piggyback on that with their teaching and 
uh, if they're using the clear word, it's a lot easier for them to get there. So 1 Timothy 4, 3 through 5, others will say that it's wrong to marry and to eat the good things God created, which we should receive with gratitude. So once you're indoctrinated in Adventist worldview, the good things God created, which he has said we can eat, is understood to be vegetables and clean meats according to the Mosaic Law. So they're using their terminology that they use in, in, in the translation. So, and then Colossians 2.16, it says, don't let anyone control your life by giving you a set of ceremonial rules about what to eat, what to drink, and which monthly festivals or special Sabbaths to keep. All these rules about ceremonial days were given as a shadow of the reality to come and that reality is Jesus. So the distinction is implicit between special or ceremonial Sabbath and the weekly Sabbath. Hmm. So whereas Paul is saying, don't let anybody judge you in the Sabbath day, in our translations, they're making a distinction in special Sabbath days. You, of course, need to keep the weekly Sabbath day. Mm -hmm. but in special Sabbath days, don't let anybody judge you in those things. Fascinating. So another one, Matthew 25, 46. I have no choice but to end your lives because in my kingdom, everyone cares about everyone else, which uh, our translations say, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Whoa. That, yeah, okay, that's a little bit tweaking, you know. Um, <laughs> and that's like, just, I mean, that's beyond playing fast and loose with one Hebrew or Greek word, well, Greek yeah. in this instance, but, uh, and, and boy, they just paraphrase the whole thing. Oh, yeah, absolutely, because they teach annihilation for your hearers who don't know that, um, you know, soul sleep, and then annihilation. So if you're not a believer, then you're, uh, you know, unconscious basically to the moment of judgment. And then the judgment is you're annihilated. You're, you're not, you're not cast into hell. There is no hell. Which and a lot of these groups, uh, just so you guys know, um, these groups, a common thing that they were reacting against was uh, reform theology, mm -hmm. communism, and this idea of predestination uh, double predestination to be specific and the idea of like people God sending people to hell who had no choice of whether they were going to go there or not so he uh, specifically created them yeah and, and so a lot of these guys if you get into like Joseph Smith uh Charles Days Russell um Ellen White all of them were very anti-Calvinism and they just swung way to the other end and either went annihilation route or they went the universalistic route like Joseph Smith. Basically, Mormonism is universalism. Everybody goes to heaven of some kind. Uh, it's just a matter of which heaven you're going to go to. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's a factor. So, yeah, that's a pretty blatant verse right there. Uh, Second Peter 2.9 from Lot's experience, you can see that the Lord knows how to rescue his people, but bring the wicked to judgment to face what they have done. And our uh, translations, it would say that then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. So that's kind of bringing in more of the soul sleep mm -hmm. language. Yep. Yeah. And so... Genesis 126 and 27, but this was not the end of his work for that day. Next, he said to his son, so instead of let us, you know, um, and that being more of a Trinitarian language. Oh, sure. Okay. Uh, he said to the son, now let us make beings who look like us, meaning that the image of God is also physical which is also true with Mormons. Um, 
let us make beings who look like us and can reflect our thinking and our personality. Let's give them the responsibility of ruling over and caring for the fish, the birds, and the animals which we created. So they created two human beings, a male and a female, equal but with different functions to reflect the unity of the Godhead. Wow, they added a lot. Yeah, <laughs> that's just a little bit of insertion there. Um, John 1.1. Uh, which we're going to get to with the New World Translation as well. Oh, yeah, we will. So from the beginning, the Word of God was there. The Word stood by the side of God, and the Word was fully God. Whoa. Okay. Yeah. Uh, John eight fifty eight. Jesus answered, because I existed before Abraham was born. Instead of before Abraham was, I, I am. So John 10, 30, you see my father and I are so close, we're one. No. John 14, 8, Philip spoke up, Lord, give us just one glimpse of the father before you go and we'll be satisfied. Believe me when I tell you that the father would do everything I have done if he were here. Wow. Okay. John 14, 10. You must believe me when I tell you that I am the Father in action and that the Father is living out his life in me. All the things I've taught you were not just my own, but the Father's. It's the Father living in me who's doing all this. 